another troop convoy sailed into the Mediterranean. But this was no ordinary convoy. It was destined to form part of the greatest invasion armada in history. And the troops it carried were men of the 1st Canadian Division. For at long last, Canadian troops were to go into action. And it had fallen to the lot of the 1st Division to lead the way. To lead after waiting for over three years. At one point, when the Canadians had joined the rest of the Great Armada, hope seemed to fade. A gale blew up, and for a while, the success of the whole operation was endangered. Small landing craft could never have lived in the heavy sea. But General Eisenhower gambled on the wind falling, and he won. The ships went on. Zero hour was 0245 hours, 10th of July, 1943. First light saw hundreds of British, Canadian, and American landing craft making for the beaches of southwest Sicily. Aboard one was Sergeant Alan Grayson, a Canadian Army cameraman who on that day shot some of the great pictures of the war. This was the day for which Canadians had worked and had trained, and their training showed to good advantage. On the beaches of Pequino, they began a new chapter in Canadian history. The official announcement that flashed around the world had said simply, British, American, and Canadian troops have landed in Sicily. But behind this bare statement lay a masterpiece of planning and organization. Vehicles, guns, tanks, ammunition, and supplies moved ashore unceasingly. In North Africa, reinforcements were already being landed, ready to keep the Canadian force at top strength, and a huge base camp was set up to handle them. Canadian nursing sisters were there, for two general hospitals were set up to look after Canadian casualties. At first, the camp had the atmosphere of a giant picnic ground. And the chance for a swim in the blue Mediterranean was too good to miss. Meanwhile, in Sicily, the airport at Pequino had been taken by the Royal Canadian Regiment. Within 24 hours, Spitfires were using it as a base. Ross Monroe, Canadian press, scooped everyone with his first dispatch, and with him was Peter Sturzberg of the CBC. Italian prisoners were coming back in their hundreds, anxious to get out of the war as quickly as possible. Canadian troops had overrun the Pequino Peninsula in the first 24 hours, and had moved well inland. Sicilians who had gone to cover when the Allied Blitzkrieg started began to appear from their mountain caves, wondering just what kind of life a conquering democracy would bring in its wake. One family came back to their house to find it occupied by divisional headquarters. But philosophically, they moved their belongings out until the tide of battle had swept a little farther on. Commander of the Canadians is Major General Guy Grenville Simmons, who at 40 is the youngest general in the Canadian Army. A familiar figure appeared before the Canadians when General Montgomery came to welcome them to the 8th Army. He promised them a belly full of fighting when the Italians stopped running. With him was Lord Louis Mountbatten, Chief of Combined Operations. The advance of the 8th Army with the Canadians on the left flank was ahead of schedule from the very first landings. Further west, the Americans were driving forward rapidly, the intention being for Americans and Canadians to meet somewhere near Ragusa. One of the first towns to fall to the Canadians was Ispica, in the southeast corner of the island, where the roads branch off into the interior. Amongst the many prisoners taken by the Canadians was the commander of the 206th Coastal Division, General Akil Dave. Surrendering to General Simmons, he was anxious to have it known that in the last war he had received a British military cross at the hands of the Duke O'Connor, former Governor General of Canada. Sick Transit Gloria Mundi, or something. The lesser prisoners made up in quantity what they lacked in quality, and the quantity was numbered in thousands.
Under a burning sun and over choking dusty roads, the advance went on. When transport wasn't available, men of the Edmonton Regiment quickly adapted themselves to local conditions. General Simmons' troops pressed on to Modica, and the Edmontons were among the first in. Here, the Italians gave token opposition, then ran up the white flag. What remained of the Italian Coastal Division surrendered, which did much to ensure the success of the whole campaign. After Modica, the Canadians got two days rest, during which they had another visit from General Montgomery. These are the men of whom he later said, they have traveled farther and fought longer than any division of the 8th Army with the most frightful physical conditions and terrain to contend with. Their performance is simply wonderful, quite amazing. Their training in England has been invaluable. But after the rest, it was back to work, hard work. The going was tougher now because Germans were in front. The Americans were sweeping wide to the western tip of Sicily, while the bulk of the 8th Army had run up against the stiff defenses of Catania. The Canadian task was to cut the enemy's communication lines in the heart of Sicily and drive him back towards Mount Etna. At high speed, they moved forward through increasingly rugged country. Their way led through Vizzini and Granicelli and Caltagirone and Mirabella and Piazza Armarina to the important town of Valguarnera, deep in the heart of Sicily. At Valguanera, it was the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry who led the way into town, and the prisoners now were German, not Italian. The railway station at Piteno had been heavily bombed by the RAF, and enemy supply lines were badly disrupted. However, men of the Royal Canadian Engineers took advantage of the damage to take a welcome, if somewhat primitive, shore. While his troops were consolidating about Valguanera, General Simmons was busy looking ahead to the next objectives and planning his further lines of attack with General Montgomery. Typical of German domination of Italy was that even the ARP posters bore Hitler's signature. As the first proclamation of the Allied military government was read to the citizens of Valguanera, they seemed like slaves suddenly become free men. The Nazi fascist tyranny had come to an end. There would now be food and freedom and security, and Canadian troops were proud because their skill at arms had helped to bring this about. And to the first division, from the rest of the Canadian army, we say good luck and keep punching. We are all damn proud of you.